Sunsworn, Edge of Annihilation by Steve Leaf Chapter 1, The Whims of Fate Tension had been brewing for months in the Kaltar solar system. The Astral Union was growing concerned by the boldness of the Gloroni Syndicate. The pirate outfit was growing too large to ignore. Their expanding sphere of influence was now a minor threat to the Union itself. Planet Kaltar was the leading exporter of coal gel, a fluid used to stabilize the ignition gas in flaze weapons. Hoping to end hostilities, the Union dispatched an emissary to defuse the situation. Kalin Sill instructed his pilot to land the ship inside the hangar of the Terrible. The massive War Hulk battleship served as King Krug's base of operations. He rubbed the sweat from his palms and took in the view from the cockpit. It was vast. Many starships of various types littered the bay with no attempt at organization. Pirates of differing shapes, sizes, colors, and smells milled about. Some worked on vessels, some socialized, but all stopped to regard the Union transport. One group moved to surround the vessel, brandishing weapons. The ambassador stepped toward the rear of the ship with his soldier escort awaiting. He stopped again to take a breath. Krug's savage reputation preceded him. Kalin was not looking forward to this exchange. The stink of engine lubricant, cheap alcohol, and body odor that permeated the unopened hatch only added to his anxiety. The Union official was out of his element. He was nervous, and the perspiration gathering on his face made it obvious. Steal yourself, came a cool, mechanized voice over Kalin's shoulder. These animals sustain themselves on the fear of others. They can sense your weakness and will use it to pick you apart. Find your center, friend. The emissary turned to regard Astor's Sunsworn, and the sight gave him comfort. This was an astral Templar, an elite warrior sworn to uphold the laws and principles of the Union. He stood six inches over six feet, durable scale mesh armor covering him from head to toe. The material was nanotech known as Sin Skin. Due to an implant received upon induction, Templars could surround themselves in a skin-hugging shell. The tech could also create weapons or shields with only a thought. Each suit takes on a unique appearance according to the host's nature. Astor's was a traditional bronze. His helmet sported decorative ram's horns with a dark T-shaped visor at the center. Smooth pauldrons covered his shoulders. Layered van braces and greaves provided extra protection for his forearms and shins. Kalin glanced at the warrior's belt. Relieved to see, Ostor brought his signature soul blade. The weapon was a one-of-a-kind piece of technology, said to be powered by a miniaturized star contained within the hilt. When ignited, an intense shaft of solar energy blazed into being, creating a searing sword. The soul blade was a sun-sworn family heirloom passed down for generations. Astor inherited it when his older brother Annex fell in battle six years prior. The people called it Dayflame. Even among his peers, Astor was highly regarded. His name and deeds were spoken of with reverence throughout the galaxy. He was still young by human standards, but he had already accomplished more than most do in a lifetime. Kalin traveled with his Templar only once before. In that instance, he'd seen Astor dispatch eight cyber assassins in a matter of seconds. The memory made him smile and cringe. Thank you, Astor. Your presence is reassuring. The Templar nodded and motioned to the hatch. Kalin threw the switch to engage the exit ramp. He took a step through the ventilating mist to view and smell the hangar. A ragtag ensemble waited below, weapons aimed. Get stepping, turds, one short, gaunt pirate urged. You're on Krug's time now. Four soldiers moved to the front in advance. Kalin and Aztur followed, with four more grunts flanking. They walked off the ramp to face the Gorloni. Take us to him, Kalin said, glaring at the outspoken pirate. Just you and the Templar, King's orders. Those aren't the terms we agreed to, the emissary argued. Them's the terms now, Union puppet. You want to talk to Krug or not? Kalin looked to Aztur. The decision is yours, sir, the Templar said. Very well, Kane huffed. Under protest, I agree to the new terms you presented. Lead on. Protest? Ha! Like you have a choice. The vocal Gorloni snickered through cracked lips. The name's Jock. I'll be your tour guide today. 
If you have any questions, keep them to yourself. I don't care. I'm not much for small talk either, so keep your holes shut. That means no more protest, fancy man. Follow me. The Union soldiers parted to let them pass, groaning with disapproval. Astor and Callan exchanged glances while leaving behind what little protection they had. The pirates led the pair beyond the landing bay into the deep bowels of the gargantuan starship. The seemingly endless corridors were dimly lit and reeked of burnt fuel and musk. As towards sin skin filtered out the stench, the Kalin wasn't so fortunate. Ugh, this heap is disgusting, the emissary complained. How much farther? We're there, you sniveling sunk, Jock snapped, stopping before a pair of lumbering shield doors. He punched a code into the control panel, and the doors creaked open, sliding into the walls on either side. Jock swept low and swung his arm toward the entrance, drawing a chuckle from the rest of the crew. Step inside, honored guests. Why are we just sitting here? Drip Vengeous gripped. He looked to his mentor seated beside him in the star cruiser they were issued for this mission. Shouldn't we be observing negotiations from the inside? We should be doing exactly this, my boy, following instructions, came the expected response. High Magus Larek Duke eyed his student as he answered. The teen was Rikesh, a species native to arid worlds, with skin the color of rust and long sandy hair. Tripp's eyes were blue, a trait uncharacteristic to his kind, and often betrayed the boy's mood to his wise teacher. He was visibly tense, uneasy at the prospect of sending so few Union agents into the belly of the beast. Settle your nerves, Larek advised. Events will occur according to the whim of fate. We watch and we report. That is the duty of the Ulthar. This seems like a bad idea, Tripp groaned. The Gorloni are the greatest threat to galactic peace in centuries. We should be taking a more active role. Lyric sighed. We've been through this exercise countless times, Tripp. It's not our place to police the systems. That line of thinking runs counter to the teachings of Ul. The Union Defense Force exists for that very purpose. We are preservers of knowledge. We do not involve ourselves in the conflict. We record it. We sit on our hands, Tripp muttered, falling back into his seat. Hands that wield considerable power, his teacher countered. Power that must remain in check. We do not decide. We, we observe and record, Tripp interrupted. I got it. Still, it's kind of tough to observe from out here. We record what we see, the elder man said. We needn't have every detail of this meeting. We need only know of its occurrence and its result, a result we will discover easily enough from this disturbance. Tripp retrieved his Empyrean emerald from a pouch, rolling it over in his palm. The stone was wedge-shaped but thin and longer than his foot, resembling a green icicle. His blue orbs reflected in its many facets as the teen glared at the gem. He contemplated the lessons he learned in his time as Lyric's apprentice. I can't shake the feeling that we should be doing more. You are still learning. It is only natural to feel a degree of confusion and defiance, especially at your age, Lyric told him. We all struggle in the beginning, but I see the making of a high magus in you. You will not hold the rank of Tiro for long. As you advance, you will come to understand what it is to be Ulthar. Trip smiled and nodded as these exchanges usually ended, but he did not agree. Astur and Kalin entered the chamber side by side. A ragged strip of stained red carpet adorned the center of the expansive room, leading to the far end. An immense throne composed of starship wreckage and broken weapons loomed on a dais. At least a hundred polished skulls of various species were displayed upon it. A dozen mechanar, sentient robots, that once reigned as an imperial power in the galaxy, stood guard throughout. These were not free thinkers, though. The pirate kept them linked to a slave circuit, forced to obey his every command. Upon the throne sat King Krug, a towering member of the Trellic species. He was an imposing figure, well over seven feet in height and as broad as two human men, with reptilian and ape-like facial features and extremities. Half of the man had been replaced with cybernetics, including the right side of his face. This only added to his fearsome appearance. He rose as his guests entered and crossed his arms. The Union agents approached with caution. Astor aired each mechanar as they approached, his personal CPU scanning. 
capabilities and weaknesses displayed on the readouts within his helmet. Mechanar, designation T7BPSS, security. Physical integrity, 100%. Advantage, physical strength, 200%. Advantage, physical reaction, 127%. Advantage, targeting computer, accuracy, 150%. Strategic strike point, head, brainboard. Strategic strike point, abdomen. Strategic strike point, elbows. Strategic strike point, knees. He'd been in similar situations, and they rarely ended well but fortune favored the prepared. Kellen helmed firm to his credit. His logical mind screamed for him to get out immediately, but the official kept his composure. He was determined to carry out the mission. They were halted ten feet shy of the throne by two guards who moved to block their path. That's far enough, Krug growled more than spoke. Tell me, human, what does the Astral Union have to say that I haven't already heard and rejected? What sweet promises have your superiors concocted to win me over? His cybernetic eye locked onto Oztor, and a harmless amber laser scanned his form. Or do you come with threats? Kalin cleared his throat. Greetings, Krug, King of the Gorloni. I am Kalim Sil, Ambassador of the Astral Union. I've heard many tales of your... Cut the jabber, whacker! The king interjected loudly, startling the emissary. Get to the meat of your speech. The angry words frightened Kalin, who was already on edge. He remembered Astor's words. Steal yourself. The ambassador found his center, stood tall, and cleared his throat. As you wish. The Union can't allow the Syndicate to continue operations any longer. He stated with authority, straightening the lapels of his jacket. He carried on. You've run wild in this sector, and its residents have had enough. You will cease all illegal activity immediately, or you will face annihilation. A Union fleet stands ready beyond the range of your sensors. No sweet deals, only the offer of your continued survival. What say you to that? He audibly exhaled as he finished, relieved to have powered through his prepared statement, but nervous to receive the King's response. Krug's hands moved from his chest to his hips. That's a bold statement, especially from one such as you. I wonder, Union man, if you would be so defiant in the face of King Krug if this Templar did not stand by your side. Kalin could feel his hands begin shaking, a shiver coming over him. I would do my duty, pirate, no matter the consequences, he replied through chattering teeth. You will learn of consequences, Krug said, pulling a bulky multiplex cannon from inside his throne. Azturs took a step forward, drawing the soul blade from his hip. Consider your next move carefully, King. The lives of hundreds, your own included, depend on it. I've planned that move carefully, Templar. This is no negotiation. It is a call to slaughter. Thousands of lives will be taken today, not hundreds. Your fleet was lost the moment they exited the pockets that brought them here. Are you prepared to face the reckoning? You're insane, Astor concluded. What makes you think that your poultry army stands the slightest chance against the Union's finest? Oh, it wouldn't. Krug scoffed. There are bigger forces at work here, Sunsworn. Forces you've never seen. Oh, but they've seen you. And what would cause such a mysterious power to align with the likes of a lowly pirate king, Astor chided? Self-preservation, convenient distraction, and the promise of sin-skin technology, the king hissed with a wicked grin, all for the price of a single star system. The picture was becoming clearer now. Krug had indeed thought several steps ahead, and they'd fallen wholly into his trap. The recent aggression of the Gorloni had been nothing more than the bait that the Astral Union eagerly swallowed. There was only one way out of this now if they were going to survive. With a thought to the CPU connected to his cortex, as to a sent alert to command. Take them! Krug roared. Guinea Zin gasped as the ship's console blazed to life with as to his alert. She hit the comm that connected her to the Astral Union soldiers guarding the ramp. Fellows, we've got a problem. Sunsworn's alarm just clicked. As if on cue, she heard Flay's bolts thud and crackle against the hole outside. Heard, Gin, Sergeant Hopper's voice returned. They scammed us. Two of ours down out here. We're retreating inside. Get the field up and get this thing moving. Heard, she replied, flipping switches and depressing buttons with expert precision. Her timing was perfect. 
The ramp retracted behind the last grunt's boot, and the hatch hissed shut behind them. The transport lifted and was enveloped by a shifting energy field. A flurry of flaze blasts poured over the ship, some deflecting off the angles of the field, causing collateral damage to the hangar. Others slammed it perfectly. Personal weapons had little effect on powerful fields, but every impact whittled away at its integrity. Get us out of here, one soldier yelled. I'm on it, Guinea hollered back. But it wasn't that simple. The bay fields were up, and they'd have to disable them to launch back into space. Hopper skidded into the cockpit and plopped into the co-pilot's chair. He was an experienced pilot, though not as proficient as Guinea, and an expert gunner. Focus on evasive maneuvers and get us pointed at the exit, Gin. I'll get the field down. Guinea flashed a thumbs up and fell into a flow, weaving the transport through the barrage of enemy fire. She ignored the smaller projectiles while taking care to evade the dangerous blasts from heavy cannons. Some found their mark, punching temporary holes in the ship's field and even threatening to hull. The fields resealed in the blink of an eye, but each hit drained power from the generator. Careful, Gin. We can't take many hits like that, Hopper said as he returned fire, causing as many explosions as possible to disorient their attackers. I'm aware, Guinea returned, angered by the words. It's pretty tightened here if you haven't noticed. Quick but steady, she twisted the vessel back toward the shielded opening, firing some shots of her own as they went. Hopper grinned. He'd been riding with Gin for years. In that time, he found that a little jab could sometimes be all the motivation she needed. Guinea was extraordinary but prideful, and shined when she felt she had something to prove. He didn't miss a beat, targeting the central controls on either side of the bay opening, one pulse missile each. Internal defense systems responded to the incoming projectiles, attempting to blast them down. One defense battery did just that, destroying the missile. The other could not match Hopper's calculated aim. The thin cylinder slipped through the bolts and crashed into the control panel, blowing the generator. In an instant, the right side of the field came down, to the cheers of everyone aboard. Guinea hit the accelerator and zipped through the exit, accepting some hits to do so. Gorloni fighters lifted from the hangar to follow, and the terrible starboard assault cannons came to bear. Chapter 2. Becoming Nestled just outside the galaxy's core lay the Citadel. The Astral Templar base of power was an expansive fortified space station, anchored to a dwarf planet that was never named. Inside, commencement for this year's graduates was beginning. Arden Sunsworn, brother of the famed Aztor, completed in the top five. This was an amazing achievement, but left him feeling anxious. Only three Templars were knighted at each graduation, three of 10,000. From an early age, Arden wanted nothing more than to follow the family tradition to defend the Union. Both of his brothers made the cut. Annex, the oldest sibling, was lost in battle serving the cause, as was their father. Arden felt it was up to him to carry on the family legacy. This was his moment. Simple soldiering wouldn't cut it. He had to become an astral Templar. Relax, said Siren Red, Arden's closest friend. You're making me nervous and I don't have a prayer of knighthood. She nudged him to accentuate the point. I need this, Arden replied. You have a pretty good shot. Breathe. Arden did breathe, then reclined back. This is my dream, Sauron, and its sun-sworn tradition. When Annex made Templar, Astor and I couldn't think about anything but following his lead. We'd lay awake at night imagining our adventures on other worlds, envisioned the details of our sin skin. Mine would be crimson, accented in black with wicked gazelle horns jutting off the helmet. Astor's, well, everyone knows his armor now. He's accomplished so much. Sauron looked at him understanding. I worked my ass off, and I want to be out there with him. If I don't get knighted, I'll become the family pariah. It will have all been for nothing. Nah, not nothing. You'll still get a crap assignment in some distant world and never be heard from again, like the rest of us. The two shared a laugh. Saren was the only person who could make Arden feel better by telling him exactly what he didn't want to hear. You're feeling the pressure, and that's normal. No matter what happens, you've performed admirably. You should be proud of yourself. She paused to clear her, her throat. And let's not forget the most important part. We met here. That alone makes the whole thing worthwhile to me, she said sweetly, drawing a look from the would-be Templar. Of course, you're right. 
he agreed, and his demeanor shifted. If nothing else, I've gained the best friend anyone could ask for. And they locked eyes. The two confirmed their mutual love in silence before the moment was interrupted by loud chimes. The Astral Union anthem played then, and all in attendance stood up to pay respect to the flag that united a galaxy. Arden and Sauron continued to smile and share glances throughout the theme. When it ended, they sat in unison. Here we go, she said, twitching her eyebrows. Cross your fingers for me. Are you kidding? This thing goes on for hours. My fingers can't take that kind of abuse. They laughed again, but this time the pair was shushed by passing in structure. They sheepishly fell in line and watched the proceedings unfold with deference. It was a grand ceremony, with all the typical fanfare. The two relived moments from the past four years. They'd listened to heartfelt speeches from fellow recruits and alumni. Accolades and final nuggets of wisdom were passed to them from instructors. It all built up to the edict of graduation. All recruits in attendance were officially declared members of the finest army ever assembled. Only six assignments would be issued at this time. The knighting of three astral Templars and a squire to serve them, each named by the new Templar. Once selected, squires would be bound to their mentor. Only death or release would free them from this oath. Lord Master Crank took his position at the central podium. He gripped a traditional rolled parchment that held the names everyone was so eager to hear. Arden grasped Saren's hand and shut his eyes, steadying himself in preparation for both elation and disappointment. The Lord Master unraveled the scroll and issued the appointments written. First in class, Zell Maxin, step forward and be knighted. Zell came to kneel before Crank. The Lord Master summoned his sin skin shell and fabricated a straight blade on his right arm. He touched Zell on each shoulder with the blade, then brought it to rest on the recruit's head. Arise, Zell Maxin, Astral Templar. Maxin did rise, wiping a tear away and smiling wide. Sir Maxin, please appoint your squire. Zell looked over the graduates, casting the illusion that he was pondering the choice. The decision was made weeks ago, and everyone knew it. I call upon Wayne Crank to prove his worth through peace and conflict. Wayne came forward and bowed to the Lord Master and Sir Maxon. Arden rolled his eyes. Maxon's lifts have been on Lord Master's ass the whole cycle, he whispered to Saren. What a surprise that he chose Crank's son to shine his boots. Shocking, Saren breathed sarcastically. The two shared a chuckle at his expense. Second in class, Crank called. Arden Sunsworn, step forward and be knighted. Arden blew out a sigh of relief and stood. To his surprise, the, the assembled crowd erupted in applause. It was rare that the second in class would elicit a greater response than the first. The sun's sworn name held a special place in the hearts of Union citizens. He walked to center stage, knelt before the Lord Master, and accepted his knighting. Arden tried hard to contain the exhilaration. He did it. He joined the ranks of the Astral Templars and honored his family. Arise, Arden Sunsworn, Astral Templar, Crank said. Sir Sunsworn, please appoint your squire. Arden turned to the class. His eyes fell on one person within the mass, and he smiled wide. I call upon Saren Reed to prove her worth through peace and conflict. Saren waded through the assembly to stand before her partner and bowed to him and Lord Master Krell. She always feigned apathy for the position, but in her heart, Saren wanted this almost as badly as Arden. She knew that he would choose her, but there remained a flicker of doubt. No longer. Saren couldn't even begin to contain the puerile grin that grew on her face. Lin Shaw was named third in class and appointed Sheil Wins as her squire. Arden didn't register the rest of the ceremony as the sights and sounds drifted away. His mind raced with pictures of an imagined future serving the Union alongside Aster and Saren. It would be glorious. Chapter 3. First Contact Aster stepped in front of the ambassador and activated Day Flame, a thick shaft of light, four feet long and brilliant as a sun, formed from the hilt with a hushed buzz sizzle. It burned with an intensity that caused Callan to sweat. Krug couldn't contain his glee. A wicked grin crossed his face and the pirate fell into a ready stance. 
he wanted to leap into the fray and prove himself against this famed warrior. Trillic males, kings especially, relished in testing their skills in combat. Worthy opponents were few and far between these days. Krug salivated at the thought of squaring off with a sunsworn, but he would have to hold his zeal. A plan was in place. The king's mechanical soldiers moved in. The nearest two drew disruptor swords and sprang to attack. The remaining ten leveled Flay's rifles. Aztur was quicker, though. He kicked Sill's legs out from under him, dropping the emissary to the ground. The Templar followed with a measured spin, slashing clean through the closest mechanar. Molten tech team splashed the carpet as torsos fell away and clanked to the floor. In the same fluid motion, Aztur caught three superheated projectiles with his blade. The sun sword absorbed the flay's bolts into its core. As he finished the twist, his left hand came up aiming a flay's pistol. The Templar answered his assailants with one precise shot, piercing a distant Mechanar's brain board. Three more bots rushed in, pulling swords as they came. One went low, one high, and the last stabbed straight forward. Aztur sidestepped left, narrowly avoiding the thrust. He arced his soul blade up to meet the high blade disintegrating the inferior weapon on impact. At the same time, he kicked down hard, deflecting the third attack with his heel. With blinding speed, Astor had launched a snap kick with the same leg, sending that guard sprawling backward. More flays bolts poured in then. The Templar blocked several, but one slipped through, impacting his jaw. The hot gas ate away a piece of his helmet, but didn't reach flesh. The sin skin immediately went to work pulling a reserve nanoscale to repair itself. The disarmed mechanar retreated a few steps back and pulled its rifle. The other lunged forward again. Aztur danced past the thrust and reversed grip on his sun sword. He stabbed down with the pommel, impaling his enemy's tech teen skull. Sunsworn deactivated the blade, using the hilt of his weapon as a handle that served to maneuver the disabled bot. Now he had a shield and used it to intercept more incoming blasts. The pirate king howled in delight. This human was a sight to behold. His reputation well deserved. Their duel would be an epic engagement, when the time was right. For the moment, he had smaller fish to fry. Swarm him, Krug thought, transmitting the message to his mechanical servants through his internal rad link. More flays bolts pounded into Aztor's makeshift barrier, then the barrage ended. The Mechanar tossed the rifles aside and charged in, leaping onto the Templar. He didn't anticipate the aggressive tactic, and the first pair slammed him to the ground. The impact sent his pistol skittering across the floor. Another set piled on, followed by the rest. Astor found himself buried beneath a heap of tech team bodies, all writhing to keep him down. The assault also removed him from Ambassador Sill, who was now vulnerable. That was the idea. Krug adjusted his multiplex cannon to harpoon configuration, took aim, and fired. A barbed bolt and tether shot forth, impaling Kalin through the abdomen. The emissary howled in agony as the line tightened and pulled him toward the pirate king. Damn it, no! The Templar growled, straining to escape the grip of his captors and lift the hefty weight on his back. The sin skin enhanced his physical strength, but it had limits. He could see his ward being reeled to his death, and he was helpless to stop it. No, never helpless. As to ignited day flame, the blinding flash shot through three mechanar and sprayed others with molten metal. He willed the sin skin to produce spikes at all points of contact along his form, impaling mechanical hands and legs, loosening their grip. As to used their momentary disorientation to roll right, tumbling the entire pile. He managed a kneeling position and jerked the hilt from the limp bot's head. Sunsworn executed a circular slash, ending two more bots and causing those remaining to fall backward. He took the opening to throw his weapon at the pirate king. The sizzling blade flew end over end and severed the king's cybernetic arm. The inert limb clattered down the throne, along with the cannon tethered to Kalin. To Aztur's surprise, the trellic erupted with laughter. The events of this meeting couldn't have fallen into place more perfectly. Most of this had been telegraphed by the pirate, who palmed a remote in his natural hand. Krug flipped a switch, calling down a column of kinetic energy. 
the blunt force slammed the Astral Templar, collapsing him to the ground. Again and again, Krug triggered the hammer beam, pounding Sunsworn mercilessly. With a final activation, the column came down hollow, creating a force field around the Templar. Astor struggled to his knees and looked at Kalin. He flailed against the field, warping the energy shell with every punch. As the sin skin patched his internal bruises, Sunsworn felt his strength returning. His focus intensified, and the Templar concentrated the nanos into a large ram's head over his right hand. Astor beat against the field relentlessly, threatening the integrity of his prison. Krug foresaw this possibility as well and had prepared for it. He pressed another button on the remote. Tiny apertures opened in the ceiling above Astor, and a crimson mist spilled into the tube. The vapor washed over Sunsworn, permeating his armor, assaulting the nanotech inside. Astor twitched as he felt the effects of the mysterious cloud. It corrupted the sin skin nano by nano, disabling its functions. Astor tried to fight the process internally, pleading with his CPU to counter the viral mist. The computer could not comply. In a matter of minutes, the Templar's sin skin was forced back into its containment unit and powered down. Now he was helpless. The Pirate King grunted and laughed, more than satisfied at the outcome of this ambush. He dropped the remote and pulled a tech team axe from the heap of weaponry that made up his throne. Ambassador Sill groaned as the cannon reeled in and bumped against him. He clutched at the shaft protruding from his gut. Kalin's vision blurred due to tears and dizziness but he heard the thud of Krug's heavy steps. Each step grew louder, closer. He looked up, saw the hazy form tower over him, heard the clink of metal on metal. The ambassador felt a pinch in his neck. Then all the blurs began to spin. He didn't feel anymore, didn't see anymore. His very essence faded away. Kalen's sill was gone. Guinea banked right, left, up, then launched into a downward spiral, forcing the collision of two enemy fighters. She pulled out of the spin then, evading a cluster of bolts from the Terrible's batteries, then cut hard to port to avoid a collision of her own. The fleet is dead ahead, Hopper announced. Thirty seconds out. You're doing great, prepping the pocket drive for leap. Just throw bolts at them, Guinea shouted. I can see the readouts. We don't need a pocket leap. I've got this under grips. Hopper chuckled and proceeded to fire back at the Gorloni. He also sent a distress signal to their allies, just in case Guinea was overestimating herself. But the fleet had problems of their own. Behind the assembled Union vessels, a flurry of pockets opened. Cruisers, warships, and swarms of starfighters vomited forth from each. The foreign ships engaged the Union armada, laying down concentrated beams of purple energy. Guinea's face went white. We're in trouble, Hopper breathed. Haimagus de Uk and his pupil saw the spectacle unfold, their eyes wide and mouths agape. The ambushing ships were unlike any they'd ever seen, sleek in design and constructed of dark metal. Purple glows accented the contours of each vessel. We must retreat to a safe distance, Lyric said in a low tone. Engage the pocket drive. Take us two steps out. Are you serious? Trip snapped. This event must be recorded. It must be stopped. Look at, do as I say, Trip, Lyric cut in. A conflict of this scale hasn't been seen in Union space for centuries. Our role has never been more significant. Please, do as I ask. Trip battled away his frustration and obeyed. He guided the ship through the dimensional tunnel created by the pocket drive. In a blink, they were far from the battle. Lyric pulled up the long-range scanners to document the confrontation. His students stood and paced about the cockpit. Come here, Trip. Lyric bade him. This is a perfect opportunity for you to learn report procedure. People are dying, as have many more before them. All that history exists in our archives because of people like us. They are all remembered due to our work. Lyric stopped and turned, meeting eyes with the Tiro. Our lot in life is not always exciting, but it is important. We could save lives, as we could end them. In Ul's wisdom, he found it is best for beings of great power to avoid conflict, lest they create greater conflict. That is why we watch Trip, not out of apathy, out of discretion. Trip returned to his seat and steadied his breathing. I understand. I just don't like it. Nor do I, the High Magus said, placing a hand on Trip's shoulder. Now, if you're level, 
focus your attention on the view screens. This will be a most vital lesson. You've learned a vital lesson this day, Krug taunted, the inherent risk of trust. Astor stood defiant, hands pressed against the field. He locked stairs with the trellic, seething at his own failure. The pirate king placed a hand on the barrier as well, leaning in. You fought well, Krug said sincerely. I take no pride in this victory. You shouldn't, Astor remarked, stepping away from his enemy. I don't, Krug affirmed. Treachery is not a hallmark of my species. You know this. I do, the Templar agreed. That's why we came to negotiate in good faith. Your actions were questionable, but your character was not. You're right. I have learned a lesson today. King Krug is without honor. Krug slammed op his open palm against the wall of force and issued a low growl. His eyes narrowed, but indignation turned to acceptance as he somberly admitted the truth in a rare moment of humility. Sometimes, honor must come second to survival. This was my lesson. The Trellic turned and stomped away, leaving Astor to his thoughts. He knew this was out of character for the proud king. What force could have swayed this domineering Trellic to sacrifice his sacred honor? It's all wrong, he sighed to himself. Very wrong. Chapter 4. Close Encounters Seraph paced behind his pilots on the bridge of the Warhol reprisal. His deep purple robes billowed with each step. He only stood between five and six feet, but his fearsome presence was palpable. Seraph was Sleesk, a lithe reptilian species with dark scales and sharp teeth. The species carried a reputation for cruelty, and Seraph was no different. It wasn't the species' notoriety that kept his subordinates in line, though. Nor was it his position within the violent circle. It was the severe discipline Seroth administered to those who disappointed him. It was fear. Destroy every last ship, Captain, Seroth hissed. Yes, Minister, Captain Cow answered, and immediately relayed the command to the crew. Except that one, the Minister said, extending a clawed finger toward a lone vessel beyond the conflict. Minister? Cow asked, confused by the order, before the engagement Overlord Vice made it clear he wanted no survivors. Intensify your scans, Captain. I sense Empyrean crystal aboard that cruiser. Ulthar, the captain reasoned. Yes, Seroth confirmed. Pardon my ignorance, Minister, but shouldn't we assign the Ulthar as priority targets? I've seen what you can do. They're a credible threat. Seroth scowled and leaned down behind Captain Cow to speak into his ear. The captain felt the heat of his breath as he spoke. Those cowards are no danger to us, and the crystal is to be harvested intact. Do not question my orders a second time, Captain. Yes, Minister, my apologies. Cow ordered the pilots to position the reprisal at the center of the fleet and hold fire. For now, they would watch the scanners and call targets for the starships that already engaged. Seroth moved past the projected view screen to the front of the bridge to observe the battle. His eyes drifted to the Ulthar vessel, which was just a speck in space from his distance. He gripped his sacred amethyst and brought up his free hand, moving it in a circle. As he did, a translucent image of the distant cruiser appeared in the rippling air before him. I see you. Disciples of Ul, cherish your final moments. Leric looked up from the readouts he was examining. Do you feel that trip? The pain and suffering of our fellows? I do. Leric ignored the jab. Focus, Tiro. We are being studied. The Grand Synod? Trip asked. He always assumed that the governing council of the Ulthar were watching his trial. No, the High Magus answered. This is different. Foreign, but familiar. Trip closed his eyes, grasped his emerald, and peered into the stream, a binding force that his mentor referred to as the unseen fabric of the universe. Empyrean crystals were a conduit stone wielders used to see what others cannot. Something is there, he said, focusing harder, but it won't come into focus. I, too, am having difficulty, Leric admitted. This mystic is powerful, not Ulthar, something sinister. What should we do? Tripp asked, opening his eyes and looking to his mentor. 
Our duty, Tripp sighed. Our duty includes discovering the unknown, Mr. Vengis, Lyric said, grinning. Take us closer. We must uncover this phantom. Tripp shrieked in glee. Yes, High Magus. He gripped the controls and initiated a short pocket jump to take them to the edge of the battle. It was then that Tripp noticed a struggling cruiser, isolated from the rest of the fleet. The ship fighting for its life against a squadron of Gorloni fighters. Lyric followed his eyes to the view screen projection. That is not our purpose, Tiro. We must discover. Sorry, Tripp said, punching coordinates for a double pocket jump. I'm done watching this. Time to do something. Trip, Lyric exclaimed, but it was too late. The Tiro engaged the pocket drive, taking them within meters of the Union cruiser. Trip leapt from his seat and tapped into the street, opening a bridge in space from their ship to the one in jeopardy. He rolled through just as the second jump activated. The gate closed behind him and the Ulthar cruiser leapt away with only Lyric aboard. The High Magus fell into his seat. Lyric's face dropped into his palm. Boy, you have no idea what you've done. The pocket drives hit, Hopper exclaimed. Not sure if she'll jump with that kind of damage. Primary cannon's down too, Guinea breathed. Field is barely holding at 3%. Another flaze blast rocked the cruiser, crashing the field. Hopper's controls exploded in a shower of sparks, launching him to the ground. The soldiers rushed in from the back. Private Sanders moved to inspect the sergeant while Corporal Vash took his place as co-pilot. Guinea split her focus between the task at hand and Hopper's status. How is he? she yelled at the soldier, gazing back over her shoulder. He's... The tone of his voice finished the thought. Guinea looked back to the view screen in disbelief. Her relationship with Hopper was the deepest she'd ever known. She didn't fully appreciate that until this moment. Grief overtook her. Gin, the new co-pilot called, but she didn't hear it. Guinea's emotions consumed her. Another blast tore into the ship. Fields were down. Zin! A glowing green portal flashed into being in the passenger compartment then. A young man in olive robes tumbled through. The gate faded from existence and the crew cast incredulous looks his way. Don't shoot, Trip said, rising from the ground. I'm here to help. You're a disciple of Ul, Sanders said in amazement. We're waist deep in the shit, Vash hollered back, trying to maneuver the ship with damage controls. Pockets gone, our fields just fell, and our pilot is checked out. Trip looked to Ginny. She was staring blankly tears streaming down her cheeks. Remove her and take the council, he instructed. Get us back to the fleet. I'll hand her our defenses. Heard, Vash acknowledged. He helped Guinea from her seat to the floor and took the helm. He wasn't the greatest pilot, but the corporal knew what he was doing. Better still, he was mentally aware. Vash got them moving again and tried to find the path of least resistance to the nearest Union carrier. Trip gripped his emerald and fell into the stream as he practiced so many times under Lyric's guidance. The Tiro communed with time and space. He viewed their surroundings through that connection. Trip located the enemy fighters and tracked their movements. From this perspective, Trip could follow them all simultaneously and anticipate their attacks. The Gorloni came in from different angles, strafing the slower cruiser. Trip's movements synchronized with theirs. He weaved his hands in a pattern as though he was blocking each bolt. Outside, way gates were flashing open around the cruiser. The portals consumed the shots and spit them away from opposite points aboard the vessel. Vash was dumbfounded. He was tracking the attacks on the viewer. They should have taken several hits, but the ship was steady and no damage showed on the readouts. One bullet came straight at the cockpit. The corporal flitch, then saw a green shimmer, and it was gone. Whatever you're doing back there, keep it up, he yelled over his shoulder. Trip was completely immersed in the stream now, and he didn't even register Vash's praise. He continued to weave his arms and gate enemy fire away from the ship. The fighters intensified their attacks, as Trip was struggling to match pace. He fell to one knee under the pressure. He screamed and pushed back with all his will, forming an emerald barrier around the cruiser. The crystalline shell absorbed a barrage of flaze bolts, but Trip was weakening. His powers were taxing, and he'd never exerted himself to this extent. The Gorloni attackers were many and erratic, but the corporal did his part. He accelerated to an evasive flight pattern, 
avoiding as many flays bolts as possible. They were slipping away from the Gorloni, but the bigger challenge was still ahead. The Union ships were embroiled in battle with the mysterious fleet. Pushing through the web of chaos would be a true test of Vash's limited skills. Sanders, I don't know if I can do this, he expressed honestly. You can, sir, the private answered. We have faith in you. Vash smiled, but it was short-lived. He didn't share Sanders' enthusiasm. I do too, Guinea's voice came softly. She stood up and dusted herself off and wiped the half-dried tears from her face. But you don't have to. I can do it. You back with us, Gin? Vash asked. She glanced down at Hopper's limp form. I needed a minute. Heard, the corporal said with a nod. I'm sorry. No need, Vash told her. We sure could use you now if you're up for it. I'm good, Gin replied, feigning a smile. Wait, who the hell is that? She was looking at Trip, still on one knee in a trance-like state directing the crystal's energy. He's helping, Vash answered. I'll explain when you get us out of this. Okay, she acknowledged. Get your ass out of my seat. Vash did so, and Guinea swooped into the chair. She took the controls and went straight to task. Trip immediately felt the tension ease. Gin maneuvered the ship with elegant precision, evading most of the enemy fire. She cut thrusters as they neared the massive fray, and the Gorloni fighters peeled off. Trip felt the lull and pulled his senses back from the stream. He was gasping, on the verge of collapse, and put a hand down to support himself. We made it, he huffed. Trip hadn't heard the conversations that took place while his focus was elsewhere. Out of the pot and into the fire, Sanders said with a wink. Glorious. Wait, Gin said, pulling back on the accelerator. What is it? Vash inquired. Look at the readouts, she answered, pointing to the fleet status. The Union Navy was near defeat. Most of its vessels destroyed or crippled. We lost this one, boys. If we go in there, we're good as dead. I hate to say it, but our best bet is to skip out while we have the chance. The drive is sparking, but I'm all for trying. We can do more, Tripp pleaded, climbing to his feet. He was still catching his breath, but he was ready for another round. Not if we're stardust, Gin called back. It's your call, Vash. You're the ranking officer here. You've been around the block, Gin, longer than I have. I trust your judgment. Ginny smiled, genuinely this time. Get us out of here, the corporal ordered. Saroth saw it all unfold. Unlike Trip, his connection to the stream was ever-present. He'd mastered his power decades ago. The tasks this Tiro struggled to perform were second nature to the minister. He could feel Trip's sense of accomplishment when the Gorloni fell back, and he answered it with a mocking smirk. This cruiser has entered the battle, Captain Cow, he said, pointing to the ship's signature on the projection. See to it that they arrive safely at their intended dock and mark the carrier for protection. Disable only. Understood, Minister, Cal replied. At that moment, the ship opened a pocket and jumped away, draining the blood from the captain's face. Sir, the cruiser has engaged this pocket drive. They're gone. Saroth stopped his pacing but didn't turn to face him. Cal could only imagine what would come next. The minister was a complex being, to say the least. He'd kill a man in an instant for the slightest transgression. He was also known to uncharacteristically show mercy at times. The captain believed he was deliberately erratic to keep subordinates on their toes. What is our battle status, Captain? The battle is ours, sir. The Union is down to three functional warhawks, all severely damaged. Several fighters and cruisers have attempted retreat, all routed and destroyed. I estimate decisive victory in approximately fifteen minutes, less if they surrender. Fifteen minutes, then, Sarath hissed. We accept no surrender today. Thank you, Captain. Cal bowed, blew a sigh of relief, and resumed his duties. Sarath left the bridge and retreated to his private chambers. He replayed the day's events in his mind. Everything unfolded precisely as he'd hoped. Even Krug and his Gorlonani performed with distinction. It was almost time for phase two. He flicked his wrist launching his amethyst from a forearm sheath into its waiting grasp. His other hand came up to weave a warp in space. A purple-hooded human with a chiseled crystalline beard came into view. The imposing man shifted his glowing violet gaze up to Sarath's reptilian eyes. Overlord, 
Vasilisk greeted, following to Ania. You've done well, Sarath. Drake and Vice congratulated with an impossibly deep resonance. That baritone voice was one of the few things that could shake the fearless minister. For your glory, Sarath replied. For the Violet Circle, Vice corrected. The Astral Union is a disease that has far much time to incubate. In the coming days it will be cleansed. Yes, Overlord. Finish business in Kaltar. Minister Krill is in place and awaiting your signal. Retrieve the Ulthar and execute Operation Headshot. Have the Templar sent to me when extraction is complete. Leave no one else alive. The Apprentice has escaped, the Sleesk admitted. That's unfortunate, but of little concern, Vice said with a wave of his hand. In time, we'll have them all. What of the Gorloni? Sarath asked. They've proved their worth, the Overlord said, nodding. Use them as necessary while the war continues. When the dust settles, Krug will rule Kaltar, as promised. Sarath rose and bowed. The warp in space faded away in a violet shimmer. Chapter 5 High Command Could you repeat that? Lord Commander Lane asked in amazement. Yes, sir, Commander Zev replied via encrypted Radlink. Ambassador Sill and Commander Sunsworn have been captured. Fleet Zeta-7 is under heavy attack by a foreign force. Please advise. Stand by, Commander, Lane said before muting the link. He looked to his second, High Commander Ground, who was often found by Lane's side. Ground was an impressive specimen of the Vorten giant species. The High Commander was broad and pale, standing nearly eight feet tall. Ice blue plate armor covered his hulking form. An open-faced helm fashioned after a roaring beast sat upon his bald head. A foreign force, Grom echoed. What alien powers remain that the Union has not faced and felt? None that I know of, Lane said. But the universe is a big place. Many unexplored galaxies lie beyond our watch. Even dark parts of our own galaxy have yet to be discovered. We must answer this incursion, Lord Commander, Grom insisted. Indeed, we will but we need answers first. Pull all Templars back to the Citadel and fortify this position with Alpha Fleets 1, 2, 6, 9, and 10. Ready a recon squad to rendezvous with Commander Zev. When we learn more of the threat, we'll take the necessary steps. Keep this quiet, High Commander. Ground saluted and lumbered away. Lane immediately opened a channel to the Obelisk, former home of the famed Ul. Also the current base of operations for his legacy, the Ul Tharm. He demanded to speak with the Grand Synod. Given his status, the request was accommodated. How can we assist you, Lord Commander? Spoke Grand Magus Ute, voice of the Grand Synod. The man was ancient, with a high-pitched cracking voice that never fluctuated. Lane often wondered why the disciples of Ul wouldn't choose another to represent the Order. Greetings, Grand Magus. Unfortunately, there is little time for pleasantries. The Gorloni dispute has taken an unexpected turn. I need to know what your observers have reported. They have not reported, Ute stated simply. Contact them. I need more information on the situation, Lane explained. We will contact them, yes, the elder man replied in his usual even tone. Time is of the essence, the Lord Commander pressed. We understand, Ute said. Thank you, Grand Magus. I'll be awaiting your transmission. Very good. Lane severed the link. There were few men in the galaxy that frustrated him more than Grand Magus Ute. Always tranquil, no inflection in his voice. Never one for clarity, the old man was unintentionally irritating. The Lord Commander dreaded their next conversation. He was certain the call would come long after he'd already had the situation handled. Ute didn't seem to have a sense of urgency. He reopened the link with Commander Sev. Maintain position until the Reekscom squad arrives. Yes, Lord Commander. Lyric's head fell when he saw the green communication gate swirl before him. As he suspected, Ute rippled into view on the other side. Salutations, Grand Magus, he greeted. Hi, Magus. Ute began. It has come to our attention that your current assignment has become an event of note. That's correct, Grand Magus. All documentation is in order, I assure you, Lyric confirmed. Excellent, Ute said slowly nodding his approval. Please forward all records from your time in Kaltar to the obelisk. Of course, Grand Magus. 
The portal shrunk and closed, leaving Larrick to his thoughts. For a moment he considered altering the report, hoping that Trip would soon return. This event was too important, though. This wasn't the time for emotion, and there was always a chance that the Synod was watching. The High Magus complied with the request, excluding nothing. Trip made his decision, and he would have to face the consequences of his actions. Still, Larrick was already formulating a plan to defend the young man. Trip wasn't just another Tiro. Larrick found him on the war torn world of Jusk more than a decade ago. His family was dead, and the boy was scavenging to survive. Larrick was a recently appointed Magus, and Jusk was his first solo assignment. Against Ulthar directive, Larrick intervened. He took Trip from the dying world and raised him as his own. Larrick saw great potential in the child and saw the power behind those blue eyes. He began Trip's training long before it was sanctioned by the Grand Synod. Trip was a listening testament to Larrick's inclination to defy the teachings of Ul. That fact was never lost on the Tiro as he struggled to understand the hypocrisy, nor was it lost on the Grand Synod, who continued to watch the pair closely. The High Magus shook away the memories and focused on the task at hand. Trip's fate was not his to decide. There were more pressing matters, too. Rooting out this mysterious stone wielder and discovering their role in the assault was paramount. High Commander Graum stepped through the halls of the Citadel with purpose. He made his way to the audience hall where the graduation ceremony was coming to a close. He knew Anza Foss, Chief Reconnaissance Officer, was in attendance. She wasn't answering his transmits, and Graum had no time to wait. Guests cleared a path as the giant pushed into the crowd. He found Commander Foss by the stage. She was speaking with the latest Sunsworn to be inducted into the Astral Templars. Arden's eyes went wide as the ground strode up to them. High Commander, he gasped, falling to one knee. He'd studied the ground's career extensively and had a great deal of respect for the Vorten giant. Ground smiled at the respectful gesture and saluted the initiative. Rise, Arden's son sworn, he said, raising his hand. He knows my name, Arden said under his breath in astonishment. Saren snorted, trying to contain her laughter. I congratulate you on your appointment, Templar, Ground said, clapping the graduate soldier. Apologies for the interruption, but I have urgent business with Commander Foss. You and I will speak soon, I promise. Of, of course, Arden stuttered, still awestruck. The officers moved away, and Saren punched Arden in the arm. Really? she asked through a snicker. What? he replied sheepishly. That was High Commander Ground, hero of Zandro. I know who he is, Saren said, rolling her eyes. He's even more impressive in person, Arden breathed. So, do I have competition then? She teased. What? Oh, come on. They shared a laugh, but Arden was preoccupied. His eyes followed the departing officers through the crowd. What do you think that was all about? He asked. She followed his stare. Business. There's always important business around here. It's got to be pretty damned important for Ground to get involved, and Foss for that matter. You know what she does, right? I don't, actually, Saren admitted, smirking. I didn't collect the trading cards. Arden accepted the jab without reaction. He was curious now. The High Commander has important business with the Templar's recon expert. That could only mean one thing, an imminent threat to the Union. I'm going to follow them, he said, stepping in their direction. What? Why? Saren balked. Something's up. It doesn't concern us, Arden. Just enjoy your day. You finally got everything you wanted. Arden shook his head. Something isn't right. She saw the look on his face and knew what it meant. He was already committed. All right, let's go. The pair passed through the assembly and ducked into the passage taken by Grom and Onza. The locker-filled hallway was shut down and dimly lit. As they crept forward, the pair heard whispers echoing from a split further down. Arden stopped and set and held up his hand. Saren nodded. That's impossible, Foss's voice exclaimed, louder than intended. Quiet down, Ground scolded. It is more than possible. It's happening as we speak. Assemble your team. Leave for Kalthar within the hour. Foss needed more. Where would the Gorloni dig up a fleet capable of besting Zeta-7? And how in the name of Ul did they manage to capture Aztor's Sunsworn? That man lives and breathes victory. 
Saren clutched Arden's arms at the words. Those are precisely the questions that need answering, the High Commander said, frustration evident in his voice. Move now, Anza, we have precious little time. As you command. The officers moved down and Saren struggled to pull Arden into the closest room. He didn't speak a word, but she knew exactly where his mind was. You're going to hop that flight, she reasoned aloud. I have to, he replied. Think about it, Arden, and think hard. The Union's best is going after him. You were knighted only an hour ago. I know what it means to you. Don't throw your dreams away. Let them handle it. He turned to meet her eyes with his own. It means so much because of him, Saren, because of Astor. I'm not just going to sit there and hope. Not when I can do something. You have to trust... I can't, Arden interjected. I can't. He's all I have left. You got me, she said and leaned in to kiss his cheek. He looked at her, then kissed her also. I know. But you have to go, she sighed, a tear rolling down her face. Yeah. She nodded. Well, you're not going alone. He began to protest, but she put a finger to his lips. You're all I've got, Arden Sunsworn, Saren said, and I'm your squire. It's my duty. He grinned, knowing that she was as stubborn as he is. If he tried to stop her, she would manage to sneak aboard that ship on her own. The matter was settled. They were going together. Very well, squire. Now how are we going to get on Foss's recon ship? I've got an idea, she replied with a twinkle in her eye. Anza Foss boarded the stealth cruiser Blade Vortex with a squadron of Union scouts. She'd commanded this team for only a few months. Foss was still learning names and assessing their capabilities. She respected every soldier, though, and stood by the boarding ramp to salute each one as they entered. The passenger compartment was lined with two paired seats and the grunts issued in two by two, front to back. Arden and Saren sat next to each other, disguised in Union scout armor. The armor's true owners were accidentally locked in the shower station of barracks 2237 and couldn't make the trip. Here we go, Arden said, nudging her. Just keep it cool, Private Singer, she replied, emphasizing the name on his uniform. Of course, Private Yang, she said with a wink. You sure we'll get there before those two get out? I did my best to lock them down and divert the surveillance feeds. Should give us a couple hours. I do feel a little guilty, though. Don't, Arden said, leaning in and lowering his voice. Singer will thank you later. He has a thing for Cynthia. Trapped naked with his dream girl for hours? Now I feel he owes me. Chapter 6. The Doctor A series of electrical shocks left Aztur Sunsworn unconscious. He was pulled from the energy cage and taken to the laboratory of Dr. Whelan. The cyber surgeon was notorious for taking sadistic glee in his patient's torment. Regardless, his work was extraordinary. Driven underground, the doctor found a place among the Gorloni. It was Wayland who made King Krug the menacing machine man he is today. After a time, the Templar's senses returned. Aches and stabbing pains creased over his body from internal burned-out bruises. His sin skin came back online and fed itself into his system. The nanos immediately went to work repairing the damaged tissue. It also flooded his body with medicines designed to dull pain and quicken healing, but he was still in agony. Reinforced tectine restraints held him in place, face down on an operating table. Astor groaned from the discomfort and frustration. Are you with us? Waylon asked, his voice hauntingly soothing with a slight digital echo. The offensive capabilities of your armor have been disabled, Sir Templar. The healing functions remain functional. You will need to be in optimal health for the procedure. Procedure? You mean the removal of my sin skin? Astor reasoned aloud, slurring the words. You are correct, Sir Templar. This will ultimately benefit you. What? Astor said groggily. You're stealing it for your masters. True, the doctor agreed. But I have also performed a great service to you. Service? Enlighten me. I shall, Wayland said matter-of-factly. You are obviously unaware of the mind-altering software that was poisoning your brain. I am not surprised. What are you babbling about? asked her demanded, turning his head in an attempt to look at the doctor. Wayland leaned down to accommodate his patient. The man was short and thin, pale and bald with discolored lips and silver eyes. 
Initially, Aster couldn't tell if he was human or the product of some interbreeding. From this distance, though, the Templar could see a myriad of minute circuitry coursing over the doctor's head. Wayland wore a scintillating metallic lab coat that moved at his mental command, not unlike Aster's own sin skin. You're a pawn, Sir Templar, unwittingly so. It is a sinister program implanted along with your sin skin. It is designed to alter your thought patterns, make you more agreeable to Lane's agenda, an agenda you would likely oppose with great fervor. The process was near completion. Fortunately, I discovered the application and severed the connection. How convenient, Aster said sarcastically. I suppose I should cooperate now, as I'm in your debt. Your cooperation is not required, the doctor stated flatly. I have infiltrated your CPU and taken command of the system. I have also restrained your physical body. You are subjugated, Sir Templar. I shared my findings as a professional courtesy. Aster wasn't sure how to respond. Of course, Dr. Whalen was correct. There was no need to manipulate him at this point. He was helpless. Can you show me? He asked. Whalen rotated the surgery table with a thought. An internal remote link connected him to every machine in the laboratory. Aster was flipped over and came to rest at a 60 degree angle. A holographic image materialized over him. His body was mapped out on the projection. It tracked the data of his organs and implants in real time. The doctor pointed to one contact point between a string of nanos and the Templar's amygdala. Here, he said, circling the point with his finger. The screen reacted and highlighted this area with a soft orange glow. Do you see this darkened line? That was once a vibrant green. I severed the upload. I can point to portions of the brain that have sustained damage if you wish. The abnormalities will normalize in a few days now that the connection is disabled. You're saying the Union was attempting to control my mind? Aster asked, still unconvinced. It is more of a subtle reprogramming, Sir Templar. From what I have discerned, the conditioning solidifies over the course of six to seven years. Once finalized, the subject can no longer view orders issued subjectively. Requests are viewed as reasonable, even if they are not. That's ridiculous. Why would they have that? I have my theories, Waylon mused. Your associates are not what they seem. You'll come to understand. What? All will be revealed in time. I want you to rest now, Commander Sunsworn. By my calculations, you should be healthy enough for surgery in approximately 37 hours. And then I die, the Templar reasoned. Not necessarily, Dr. Whalen corrected. You're an extraordinary member of your species. I estimate your chances of survival to be greater than 30%. That's comforting, Astor scoffed. Rest, the doctor insisted. The procedure will be a trying experience. Astor was less than pleased by the declaration. He appreciated Wayland's forthright nature. He wanted to believe that all this talk of Union deception was nonsense, but couldn't shake the feeling the doctor was being sincere. Astor was also beginning to question the rumors. The Templar had come into contact with all kinds throughout his career. He could sense wickedness in a man, and got no such feeling from Waylon. I leave you in the capable hands of my assistant, Clutch, the doctor said. With a wave of his hand, the table spun again. The hologram faded away and an imposing mechanar stood before Astor. The bot stood as tall as a trellic, with a sculpted interior reminiscent of ancient Roman armor. He was finished in a brown chrome and sported an almond-shaped hard hat atop his square head. A single ocular unit occupied most of the frontal facet, throwing off a soft yellow glow. Clutch placed a clenched fist over his face. Astor recognized the traditional salute of respect used by the Mechanar Empire. I am honored to meet you, Astor Sunsworn. What, Astor said, is that thing sentient? Since he was a boy, he'd only known Mechanar to be subservient slaves. History taught that machines once dominated a large part of the galaxy. In recent centuries, most were reduced to servants, used and abused as tools for their masters. This thing, Clutch repeated, hurt by the words. Now, now, the doctor interjected. He meant nothing by it, Clutch. Wayland turned to Astor. He is indeed sentient. He is also sensitive. Astor apologized and nodded as best he could in his position. I leave you two to get acquainted, the doctor said, exiting the room. Thing? Clutch said again moments later. I'm sorry. 
I've never known one of your kind to be self-aware. We all were, once, before the war, before the slave circuits. The Mekinar seemed to have a moment of tribulation. My full name is Clutchnum Narmaticularis, designation T1BPHL, produced for heavy labor. Clutch, got it, Astor said, laughing for the first time since his capture. How does a labor bot end in the service of a surgeon? Dr. Wayland rescued me. He restored my mind. I do not serve him. We are friends. That maniac freed you? Astor asked in disbelief. That doesn't line up with what I've heard. He is not a manic, Clutch insisted. He is brilliant and does not deserve that twisted reputation. Then why does he have it? Words are diluted as they travel. Deeds become something different. Perceptions become reality. Some view you as a god, Astor Sunsworn. Are you a god? Astor understood. Of course not. Dr. Whalen was troubled by your capture. He wanted it to be another Templar. Any other. He holds you in very high esteem. Why? Astor asked. He doesn't even know me. Your actions have affected many, Sunsworn, and some deeds are remembered as they actually happened. I suppose so, the Templar conceded. What have I done for him? It is not for me to disclose. Fair enough. Dr. Whalen would like you to rest, Clutch reminded him. Please do so. I will see that you are not disturbed. Astor laid his head back and closed his eyes. Clutch reminded him that he'd had a good life. He'd helped people. If he were to die in 37 hours, at least he made a difference in the galaxy. Arden would carry on the Sunsworn legacy, as he did when Annex fell. The Union would endure. Chapter 7. Stranded. Damn it! Ginny growled through gritted teeth. The damaged pocket drive took them away from the battle, but sputtered out and exploded. The shuttle was ejected back into space moments after the jump engaged. The blast took what was left of the main thrusters as well, leaving them spinning toward an unknown world. Gin couldn't get the helm back online before it plunged into the planet's atmosphere. She found herself in the unenviable position of having to perform a controlled crash. What can I do? Bash asked. Keep your ass in that seat and don't touch anything until I say so. Gin barked at him. She was under great pressure, but also irritable and abusive. The corporal knew this and complied without a word. What's happening? Trip asked Private Sanders. Better strap yourself in, the grunt answered, following his own advice. It's not looking good. They hit the atmosphere hard jerking everyone forward. Tripp didn't find his seat in time and lost his footing. He slid to a violent halt against the back of Vash's chair. Ginny felt switches and pulled levers at an exhausting pace. In a blink, she'd used every trick she had left to stabilize the impaired vessel. Pieces of the ships fell away. The temperature inside rose to uncomfortable levels. Almost through, she hollered, more for herself than anyone else. The cruiser burst free from the resistance then, and gravity took hold. The sudden lack of pressure pulled the craft down nose first. Guinea engaged the launch thrusters beneath the ship's wings to right them and keep the boat level. Tripp gripped the co-pilot's chair to lift himself and view the situation. They were on a course to meet a nearby mountain range, and Gin was struggling to alter trajectory. Beyond the range, the Tiro spotted a massive lake. If they could clear the peaks, they might stand a chance. He moved to place a hand on Guinea's shoulder, and Vash caught him by the wrist. I wouldn't do that, buddy. She'll bite it off. Just let the woman do her thing. I can help, Tripp offered, and Vash comprehended this meaning. The corporal recalled their recent encounter with the Gorloni fighters. Tripp's strange abilities were the only reason the shuttle wasn't blown to bits. Guinea, Vash yelled. You've got to let this guy help. I got this, she screamed back at him. No, you don't, Vash hollered back and she shot him a wicked glare. Tripp knew she was helpless to change course at this point. She sensed that she understood the situation as well. Her pride was the problem. Maintain your pl present flight path, he said calmly, and trust me. Gin didn't respond but begrudgingly obeyed. She'd lost control of the situation and she knew it. All she could do at this point was keep the ship steady as they collided with a mountain that grew bigger by the second. Tripp palmed his emerald and fell into the stream. He could feel the moment of impact approaching and counted down. Those around him could hear the count and brace for the inevitable, except for Vash, 
Bash smiled. Guinea saw the mountain's face speeding towards them and shut her eyes tight. She counted the seconds with trip. Two, one, zero, nothing. They should be dead, but they weren't. Gind opened her eyes to discover they somehow passed through the mountain and were zooming toward a large body of water. She grabbed the controls and lifted the ship's nose at the last possible second. The ship skipped like a rock over the lake's surface. Trip fell sidelong and bounced off walls, panels, even the ceiling. The final blow rendered him unconscious. The cruiser skidded to a stop sideways and began to sink. Bash immediately unbuckled and rushed to the Ulthar's aid. He was out cold, battered and bloody, but breathing. Guinea checked the readouts to make sure the atmosphere was favorable to humans. After confirmation, she activated the distress beacon and started gathering supplies. Grab what you can and move out before it starts gushing, she called. This might be our new home for a while. Corporal? Sanders muttered from the rear. Help! Vash ran from the cockpit to find the soldier bleeding all over the place. He was impaled in his seat by a piece of wing that broke off and stabbed through the hull during the crash. Before the corporal could utter a word of comfort, Sanders was lying limp, dead. He hadn't known the man long, but the impact of the day's losses was beginning to hit him. Vash, Guinea said softly, gripping his shoulders. I know, I know, but we've got to hang in. Get your gear, soldier. We have to move. The corporal clenched his teeth and nodded his head. You're right. Let's go. They gathered what they could. Bash noticed a green glimmer under the pilot's chair while lifting Trip onto his shoulder. He picked up the Empyrean Emerald and stuffed it in his pocket. The pair climbed to the exit ramp, which was now above them. Guinea went up first, and Bash hoisted Trip after her. He glanced at Sanders once more before gripping the rim and pulling himself up. The swim to shore was arduous with the dead weight. They muscled through it with the help of small flotation devices Vash scavenged from the emergency stores. They laid Trip down and flopped on the soggy ground as one, taking a moment to recoup and discover the day's events. This is probably the worst day of my life, Gan assessed through heavy breaths. Heard, Vash agreed. Could have been worse, though. We're still alive. For now, Guinea said, even if our signal is discovered, it'll likely be someone we don't want finding us. Vash looked at her. You've got a real gloomy outlook on life, you know that? Yeah, Guinea said, exhaling. I know. Lurik Duke moved the cruiser closer and communed with the stream. He jumped ship to ship through the mystical conduit, searching for the stone wielder among them. In time, he found Seraph's power within the command ship. It was a war hulk unlike any he'd ever seen. It was twice the size of a standard battleship and equipped with enough armaments to threaten an entire fleet by itself. He tapped his emerald to open a contact window at the minister's location. The gate swirled before him and Sarath came to view. Greetings, Lyric bade. There you are, Sarath replied. I was beginning to doubt your ability, Ulthar. You know of us, Lyric reasoned aloud. We know you well, the Sleesk confirmed. Then you know that we are peaceful. Why do you enter Union space with hostility? The minister laughed in his face. Better than wait for your Union to bring death and hardship to us. That's lunacy, the High Magus argued. The Astral Union promotes peace and well-being for all. Its citizens want for nothing and live full lives. We would share such a lifestyle with others, with you. That is the lie, Sarath retorted. Your Astral Union exists in its current state through conquests. Its citizens live in complacent ignorance, all while their government steals the lives and efforts of countless billions. So tell me, disciple of Ul, why do you think we would enter your galaxy with open hostility? Leric was taken aback by the charges. He quickly cleared his mind and deduced the declarations must be false. That cannot be true. The records are absolute. Such atrocities would be documented and opposed by my order. Poor fool, Sarath laughed. Your masters are complicit. Impossible. Are you willing to bet your life on their virtue? The Sleese asked. I wouldn't. The High Magus pondered the words, unsure of how to proceed. If there was even a hint of truth to this alien's words, war or no war, the galaxy was about to be turned on his head. Sarath sensed his distress. Meditate on this knowledge, human. Contact me when you've found your answers. 
but find them soon. If I must come to you, there will be no more discussion. Sarath blackened the window, and Lyric allowed it to close. His mind was churning with possibilities. Could the Sleesk be telling the truth? The ramifications would be disastrous. The High Magus sat cross-legged and linked with the stream, meditating on this news. If the Union truly brought this wrath upon his people, Lyric intended to find out. Chapter 8 Dark Dealings We have a problem, Grom informed the Lord Commander. The Head Templar was enjoying some quiet relaxation in his observation chamber. The command station was his sanctuary, with an open view of space around the citadel that soothed him. Lane came here frequently to rest his mind and escape from the stress of his position. Interruptions vexed him. We have several, Lane said, waving his hand dismissively. Could you be more specific? Graum handed him a viewpad. The screen displayed footage from the shower station in barracks 2237. Inside, two naked forms struggled to force the doors open to no avail. Hi, Commander. Your hobbies may indeed indicate a problem, but this is of no concern to me, Lane chided, tossing the viewer back at his second. Lord Commander, this is Private David Singer and Private Cynthia Yang. They were recently assigned to Vortex Squadron under Commander Onza Foss, Graum explained. Their signature codes were recorded boarding the Blade Vortex, sir. They were just found barricaded within the shower station. Anza's team departed several hours ago. Lane leaned back in his command chair and put a finger to his lips. There's more, Lord Commander, Ralph said. Speak it. Arden Sunsworn is missing, along with his squire, Saren Reed. The inductee was scheduled to receive Sinskin implantation last cycle. He didn't appear for the appointment. I suspect the two complications are related, sir. Of course they are. Lane patronized. If Arden somehow learned of his brother's fate, he no doubt infiltrated Foss's company to attempt a rescue. Send a transmit to the Blade Vortex. Inform Foss of the circumstances and let her handle it. There's an another damned problem, Lane growled, coming forward in his seat. Yes, Brown confirmed. The Blade Vortex is under shroud. As such, she cannot send or receive transmits. The Lord Commander's face fell into his hands. Of course. Orders, sir? This is a complex situation, Ground. For the time being, we have to trust Commander Foss to discover the stowaways and act accordingly. Lane reclined in his chair once more, gazing out at the stars. We'll deal with Sunsworn and his squire when they return. Such a disappointment. Ground saluted and left the chamber. Lord Commander Lane sealed the door behind him and closed the observation ports. He turned to the comm station and went through a tedious routine of security protocols. The complex code was required to open a channel to his agent in a distant galaxy. A visual transmit came back as the codes cleared. A Templar covered in black sin skin appeared on screen. He wore a closed face helmet with sleek bat-like wings. The warrior glared at Lane through thin, tinted eye-viewing slits. What is it, Lord Commander? A distorted, mechanized voice demanded more than asked. Our enterprise is in jeopardy, Baron Forath, Lane stated. You're aware of the Kaltar debacle? I received the intel, the Dark Templar confirmed. Then you know what's at stake. I do, Forath affirmed. We must act quickly to clean this up, Lane continued. We? I'm going to need assistance on your end. Vorath was silent. I need you to track down the attacker's galaxy of origin and cut the head off the beast. The Dominion is stretched thin already, Lord Commander. I don't have the resources to launch another operation. I'm not asking for a full-scale assault, Baron. I'm asking you to do what you do best. Find them, kill their leaders, and return to your business. I'll send the Rooks, Vorath assured him. No, Lane pressed. You. I need results that only you can deliver. Go alone and keep it under wraps. Vorath felt silent again, striking a defiant posture. Remember your place, Baron. Lane reminded. He was growing weary of the Dark Templar's frequent impudence. Forth was quite malleable in his first years of service, eager to impress and loyal to a fault. At some point he'd grown arrogant and detached, and he wanted less and less to do with the Union concerns. The Lord Commander was losing patience with this song and dance. Do as I command. Very well, Forth said. Do you have a source point? Our recon squad is approaching the scene. Lane informed him. 
I will have more details shortly. Useless as ever, Voreth grumbled, leave it to me. He cut the transmit, leaving Lane to his business. The Baron opened a link to his personal docking bay. Deck Officer Rave answered the call. Mr. Rave readied the eclipse. My lord, the Deck Officer replied curiously. Vorath's personal craft was outfitted for solo stealth missions. It had been more than a year since the Baron put it to use. Reeve had gotten used to the mundane days of routine maintenance. Prep the ship, Vorath said, anger evident in his voice. Of course, my lord, the deck officer acknowledged. She'll be ready for departure within the hour. See that it is. Vorath hammered the communications panel with his fist, denting the tech team housing. He'd been disconnected from Union space for years. The Baron had no desire to jump into events that would take him back there. In his mind, the Astral Union was behind him. The Dominion was his life now. He was furious that the Lord Commander would pull him from his command to tie up another loose end for the Union, this time in their own space. One day, Lane, he mused, gripping the hilt of his void saber, you and I will meet for the last time. Vorath put together a mission kit, gathering emergency rations, medical supplies, and other odds and ends for the trip. The Baron attached several warp grenades to a bandolier and strapped it on. He retrieved his cybernetic arm from its charge port and affixed it to the lock joint at his shoulder. Vorath left his corridors and made his way to his personal docking bay. Reeve was finishing up preparations as he entered. The Eclipse was perched on a raised platform at the center of the chamber. It was a unique vessel, smaller than the average cruiser and sleek in design. The black craft was reminiscent of a bird of prey with a pointed nose, forward arcing wings, and twin landing pegs resembling talons. She's all juiced up and ready for launch, my lord, the deck officer said with a nervous smile. Good. Reeve punched a code into the ship's terminal and the entry ramp came down with a hiss, spraying ventilation gas. You are my contact on base, Officer Reeve, Vorath told him. Me, sir? Do you have an objection? The Baron asked, staring the man down. Of course not, my lord. Stand ready to receive my transmissions. Inform the Imperator of my departure, no one else. I will return post-haste. Yes, my lord. Vorath boarded and closed the hatch. Welcome, Baron, a female voice greeted through the intercom. Wraith? He acknowledged. Wraith was the Eclipse's artificial intelligence invaluable to Vorath on solitary journeys. She could perform all the ship's actions in his absence, which came in handy while he was away from the vessel. Shall I take us out, my lord? The Baron moved to the cockpit and took the controls. No, give me the helm. Wraith complied and Vorath powered on the lift engines, retracting the landing pegs. While he loathed the idea of bowing to Lane's command, the thrill of a new mission always energized him. He ordered Reeve to open the bay doors, and the Eclipse shot from the tower and into the clouds. Vorath wasted no time firing the rockets and breaking the atmosphere. Calculate a pocket to the Kaltar system. Shortish route. Pocket ready, Baron, Wraith announced seconds later. Engage. Chapter 9. Primeval. Roundabout, Anza Foss instructed Captain Timmins over his shoulder. We need to sweep the surrounding area before diving in. Direct all auxiliary power to the shroud, engines, and sensors. Heard, he acknowledged. Foss strode from the bridge to the passenger chamber. All soldiers fell silent and gave her their full attention. Arden and Saren sunk into their seats. They made a point to keep their padded hoods pulled low when their helmets were off. So far, they were lucky. Singer and Yang must be new, because no one questioned their sudden change of appearance. Commander Foss addressed the gathering. Well done, soldiers, she began, impressed with the discipline of her new company. We are nearing our destination. I need you all at full alert. The shroud shields us from detection, but there are sensors that can pierce it. I don't need to remind you that the enemy is alien. We've never encountered such a force in this galaxy. We have no idea what they are capable of. The company saluted their commander, and she returned the gesture. A ping from the cockpit caught her attention, and she moved to investigate. Commander, we're picking up an active distress beacon, Timmins explained. There, planet friend Thars. Source? Foss inquired. Union, the pilot answered. Anza considered the implications. It could be a trap, but this far out? Doubtful. 
It was likely a ship that escaped Kalthar. Survivors could offer some much-needed insight. Take us down, Captain. Keep us shrouded and watch those scanners like a Dior Falcon. Heard, Commander. They'd been stranded for nearly a day. Guinea and Vash found a suitable area to erect a base camp hours after the crash landing. Atop an accessible plateau, they made Trip as comfortable as possible. He was in and out of consciousness, and they were increasingly concerned that his injuries could be life-threatening. Concussion? Guinea asked, looking at the Tiro but speaking to Vash. It's hard to say, the corporal replied. I'm no medic. That was Sanders' area of expertise. The boy does have a nice-sized knot on the side of his head. Damn it. And obviously disheartened Guinea spat. He'll come too, Vash said. I hear the disciples are resilient. And I hear you're slick at crafting stories, Gin said with a smirk. I appreciate you trying to comfort me, even if you're full of crap. Vash struggled, and they shared a laugh. The levity was soon broken, though, by a clatter over a nearby ridge. The pair drew out sidearms and approached the area quietly. They split up to come from different angles. Vash held up a hand to stop Guinea, and he stepped closer, peering over the edge. A clawed hand the size of a riot shield swiped up at him from below, sending the corporal reeling to land on his back. A bellowing, gurgled roar followed, and the creature pulled itself over to the lip of the plateau. The beast was as large as a drift car and covered in matted gray fur that blended well with the rocky terrain. Its hunched body resembled a giant gorilla, with a broad torso, four muscled arms, and two shorter legs. Membrane connected the limbs, presumably for gliding. All six appendages ended in four-fingered hands that sported chipped talons. The creature's head was long and egg-shaped with a wide beak that spanned ear to ear. Nine diamond-shaped eyes ran from nose to crown, all focused on Corporal Vash. It roared again and lunged. Vash rolled left, narrowly avoiding the beast's slashing claws, which left etched lines on his plastium armor. He responded with a shot from his pistol that singed its head a burn that left one of the eyes ruined. Guinea unleashed a barrage of flaze blasts and ran for the nearest stone. She placed the natural barrier between herself and the creature. The beast howled and leapt for Vash, enraged by the stinging hits. The corporal rolled again and again. He flinched as it pounded fist after fist into the ground, trying to pulverize him. He regained his footing, leveling his weapon for an attack, but the creature was on him. It backhanded Vash catching him in the chest and launching the man more than twenty feet into his own tent. Guinea screamed and fired another burst of flaze bolts into its back, drawing the monster's attention. She popped the pin on a slag grenade with her offhand and tossed it at the creature. To her surprise, the beast caught the projectile with one hand and charged. Three strides later, the explosive blew, blasting off two of the creature's arms and part of its torso and face. It shrieked in agony and tumbled into a heap smashing face first into the rock Gin was using for cover. Guinea jumped and cheered in celebration. Her glee faded fast, though. Down the cliff face, many more beasts roared in response. Shit, she muttered and ran back to the campsite. Vash was emerging from the tent on his hands and knees, clutching his chest and spitting blood. Gin slid down next to him. Are you all right? she asked, looking him over. I'm not sure, he answered. Feels like a few things might have snapped. Can you walk? Not sure about that either. He rose with Guinea's help, but stumbled and dropped back to one knee. I don't think so, Gin. There's more coming, Vash. We have to move. You have to move, he corrected, fear plain in his face. Looks like me and the Ulthar have reached the end. That's crap, soldier, Jin growled. Get on your feet. Vash sat down. It's reality, lady. I'm done. Now get moving. I'll cover you as long as I can. No! Guinea half screamed, half cried. Yes! Vash came back in a whisper. You're wasting valuable time. The roars grew closer and more numerous. Vash looked past Guinea to see claws and heads coming over the ridge. Run! he yelled at her. Guinea hesitated, looking from Vash to the coming monsters. Seeing little recourse, she did it he, as he instructed sprinting away as fast as her legs would take her. She heard Flay's fire and didn't look back. An explosion followed, but still she ran. Vash bravely shielded her retreat. She wouldn't let his final act be in vain. Chapter 10. Hunch 
Astor's eyes opened. He didn't realize that he allowed himself to drift off. Clutch was standing next to him, monitoring his vitals. You're coming along, sir, the Mechanar observed. How long was I out? the Templar asked. Twenty-three hours, seven minutes, fifty-four seconds. Damn. Any good news? Oster yawned. You're recovering faster than the doctor estimated, Clutch told him, pointing at the screen. Oster couldn't disagree. He stretched as much as the restraints would allow, and he did feel much better. The pain was barely noticeable now. That may not be good news, the Templar sighed, laying his head back. Of course it is, Clutch insisted. The sooner we get beyond this ugly business, the sooner we can all move on. Well, some of us might be dead, Tin Man, Astor said with little enthusiasm. I understand your concern, the bot replied. However, I dare say the doctor may have miscalculated your chance of survival. I estimate the likelihood to be far greater. Astor looked at him. I appreciate your optimism, Clutch, but I have to be realistic. You're a labor bot, and it seems like Wayland knows his stuff. No offense, but odds are he's probably right. None taken, as to her son sworn. Your reasoning is sound. But I have a hunch. A hunch? That's encouraging. I had a hunch you'd heal long before the doctors projected 37 hours. Here you are, almost healed. Astor paused and scanned the Mechanar's body language. If the Templar didn't know better, he'd swear that Clutch was projecting some sass. Continue your slumber, Astor son sworn, the bot prompted. I understand it quickens the healing process of your sin skin. The quicker I heal, the quicker I die, Aster lamented. You fear death? Most humans do, Clutch. It was my belief that warriors of your caliber did not know fear, sir. A hunch? Aster quipped. A hunch, Clutch confirmed. This time you're wrong, my friend, Sunswar told him. No man is without fear. How do you perform your duties with fear clouding your human senses? The bot wondered aloud. Clutch, it is the fear that drives us to succeed, drives us to be better. Fear is a gift, if you can master it. I don't understand, sir. Astor studied him. When Dr. Whalen is in danger, do you feel a need to assist him? Of course, Clutch answered. Why? It would not be right to allow a friend to come to harm. Is it against your programming? The Templar inquired. No. Then why are you compelled to help? Clutch struggled with the question. He is my friend. That doesn't sound like logic to me, Astor chided. It isn't, the Mechanar conceded. It is empathy or fear. You fear for your friend's safety. Perhaps, Clutch granted. You're more than a machine, Astor said with a smile. I am. We Mechanar have advanced far beyond our ancestors' basic programming. Over time, we developed emotions like other sentient beings. We experience these emotions to a lesser degree. Most of us still struggle to understand them. So do we, Sun Sworn admitted. So do we. How much longer? Krug demanded, narrowing his biological eye. Dr. Whalen retrieved the information from his laboratory computers with a thought. Thirteen hours, twenty-four minutes, twelve seconds. Just rip it out, the king shouted. Inadvisable, Whalen stated. The Sinskin processor is delicate. Removing the implant from a damaged host would likely result in catastrophic system failure. I assume you wish to deliver a functioning specimen to your associates. Krug issued a low growl and leaned forward in his throne. Let's call it 14 hours, doctor. Not a minute more. Understood. I will notify you when the procedure concludes. Notify me when it begins. Waylon nodded and spun away, exiting the chamber quickly. He checked in with Clutch to make sure Astor was progressing to his satisfaction. He then made his way to the docking bay to attend other business. Krug cleared the hall and opened a channel to Sarah. A holographic image projected in front of the throne, the Sleesk front and center. Greetings, Krug, he hissed. Sarath, the king acknowledged. We are fourteen hours from procurement. That is acceptable, the minister replied. You've done well. Overlord Vice is impressed with your achievements. The treaty will be finalized when the war is finished. Kaltar is yours, King. You honor me, Minister. The Violet Circle may require your services beyond Kaltar, Sarath added. Can we count on the Gorlonis' continued loyalty? Krug wasn't pleased by the notion, 
but he was in deep now. He understood that it was less of a request more than a demand. The Gorloni are at your service, minister. Very good, Seroth acknowledged. The overlord will be pleased. Krug saluted. I'll make contact when we have the sin skin. Seroth flashed an impish smile and ended the link. Jock, the king bellowed. The gaunt man stumbled into the chamber with haste. Yes, king, he said, bending a knee. Get the men ready. We'll be mobilizing in a day or two. Our part in this war isn't over. Yes, king, of course, king, Jock said, bowing twice. Get to it, then, Krug ordered. Jock fled the hall as fast as he came, screaming commands as he went. The shield doors closed behind him, but the king could still hear the man barking. Krug rolled his eyes and laughed to himself. He's an idiot, but a useful one. Dr. Whalen hustled through the corridors of the foul-smelling warhawk. Time was short. He pushed through several groups of pirates on his way. Some were throwing dice, some arm wrestling. Others were clustered in the ship's halls enjoying idle conversation. The crew was rather lax, considered they, they just ignited a war. Through the bustle of a packed battleship, Whalen could still hear Jock's loud mouth. He quickened pace. Minutes later, he emerged through the tall arches of Docking Bay 7. Even with the added odor of oil and ozone, the spacious docking bays were always a breath of fresh air. The large, open spaces were comforting after traversing the cramped vessel. Waylon pulled an oil-soaked tarp from a workbench and draped it over himself to blend in. He kept his head down and moved to the coop cruiser he'd been modifying in his spare time. The ship was full of one-of-a-kind technologies invented by the doctor. He dubbed it the Haze, due to its unique sensor-baffling fields. Wayland powered up the ship and reviewed the readouts. All systems were at full capacity. Excellent, he whispered to himself. The doctor punched in his personal code to place the ship into ghost mode. This kept the vessel running undetected, ready to engage full power with a single command. The upcoming procedure was a tremendous risk, and if he failed, Krug would surely kill him. Wayland wasn't the kind of man to gamble on his life. The haze would be ready if his plans went sideways. This has been Sunsworn, chapters 1 through 10, written by Steve Lee, edited by Bell Manuel, read by Mildred the Monk, copyright 2017, Red Gate Studios, and Steve Lee.